the name of this talk is Kernel Gan, and it's a joint work with Asaf Shocher and Michal Irani. We'll start by defining super resolution. Super resolution is a pretty straightforward task where we have a low resolution input image and we want to produce a high resolution version of it. That is it. Now, what's the relation between the two images? We assume that every pixel in the low resolution image was generated from the surrounding pixels in the high resolution image. Pretty simple. These areas are connected by a blur kernel K and subsampling alpha, meaning K runs on the high resolution image and produces from a, sev a specific amount of pixels a single pixel in the low resolution image. This is obviously a highly ill-posed problem even when we know this kernel. Even when we have knowledge about it, this is highly ill-posed because we want to produce more pixels than what we have in our hands. It turns out that current leading methods obviously use deep learning such as EDSR and RCA and use very sophisticated neural networks, but they actually assume a lot of knowledge about this kernel. Not only do they assume knowledge about it, they assume it's constant across all the images in the world. And it turns out that when this assumption does not hold, as we have in real images or as in images we take on our cell phones or we download from the internet, they perform poorly. This, this phenomena gave rise to what's known as blind super resolution. Blind super resolution all it does is it assumes explicitly that we do not know the kernel. And now blind super resolution has no information about the kernel. In this work, we approach this question mark. We will show you how, given only the input image, we estimate the image specific super resolution kernel. We get an image and we output the kernel of that specific image. We do it in a completely unsupervised way using zero examples other than the test image. We do it on the test image with no external data. Another interesting contribution in this paper is that we use deep linear networks, which is an, a massive field of research in uh, theoretical deep learning. We will show what is, to the best of our knowledge, the first practical use of these. When we combine all of the three into this image-specific kernel, and plug it into existing super resolution methods, we achieve state-of-the-art results in blind super resolution. And a more impor important contribution is that we achieve a large step towards super resolution in the wild, where we mean super resolution to any given data without any prior information. Let's look at what the majority of deep learning methods do these days. They take a large data set of high resolution images and downscale them by blurring and subsampling. And now they have pairs of low resolution images and high resolution images, which they can just take any neural network and train to undo this downscaling and to produce a super resolution image. And now at test time, they can apply this pre-trained network to any new image and produce a super resolution image. It's a standard supervised framework. There are generally speaking, and very generally speaking, three families of methods. The first one does exactly this type of training. It implicitly assumes a, s a single kernel because as you can see here in the downscaling, it did it with a spe single specific kernel K. And by that, what it's actually training the network is to undo this downscaling. And by that, they assume that the kernel can be, it is the same kernel for all the images in the world. A second family of them are trying to be agnostic to the kernel, meaning they are trying to produce a super resolution image regardless of this kernel. Without any information about the kernel, they want to produce these images, and the majority of them, what they do, is rather than downscaling with one specific kernel K, they try to downscale with a number of kernels. And in this way, they take a large number of images and a large number of kernels, downsample, and by that, hopefully, at test time, they're able to enhance an image without any knowledge about the kernel. I'll show why this does not work either. The third family assume that they receive a kernel of the image. This is also a very strong assumption because when I take a photo with my iPhone, I do not get any kernel with that. So these family receive a kernel as input and that's where we come into the picture. We will provide them that image specific kernel. But let's first look at some examples of these families. When this fixed assumption kernel holds, meaning when that single kernel we trained the network upon holds, 
it turns out that these networks actually produce very good images. So if this is a low resolution image that was downsampled with the specific kernel, this is just a, s a simple interpolation, while this is state of the art super resolution. And when we flicker between the two, note how details are enhanced and the image is cleaner and much closer to the ground truth image. But when we take them just a step sideways to the outside their comfort zone, where this assumption does not hold anymore, and there is a different unknown kernel, if this is the bicubic interpolation, this is state-of-the-art super resolution. So this is state-of-the-art assuming a single kernel across all the images in the world, which is obviously a bad assumption. And when we flicker between the two, you can't tell any difference. It's because all they do is a sophisticated bicubic interpolation. But when we take them and compare them to the third family of methods, where they assume someone gave them that kernel, this is what they do. And when we flicker between the two, you can see how state-of-the-art super resolution does not nearly perform as well as super resolution methods that assume that the kernel is given. And it turns out that also by this image and by many examples in our work, but also by previous works, that the super resolution kernel itself is more important than the method. Or more professionally, it's more important than any other prior information we have about the image. And this is where we come in, and that's what we try to solve. So let's start But what is the super resolution kernel, or how do we estimate it? If we go back to the problem definition, we have the input image. We also want to estimate the unknown high resolution image. They are related, as I said before, by some blur with the kernel and subsampling. This is the super resolution kernel. This is the one we're trying to estimate. And this is the one the methods assume they get. From a work from 2013 by Tomer Michael and Michal Irani, they proved analytically that the correct super resolution kernel, this one in the image, maximizes the patch similarity across scales. I'll note this again. The correct kernel, the one that we're trying to find, maximizes the patch similarity across scales. And if we illustrate this, if we downsampled this image once again with that same kernel, the patches across scales will be maximized. If we use a different kernel, they will not be. This specific super resolution kernel is the one we're aiming for, and that's what we were looking for in our work. In the work of Tomer Michael and Michal Irani, they also provided an algorithm to estimate it using an iterative optimization process. In kernel GAN, this work, we estimate the kernel using an internal GAN. What is an internal GAN? We'll, just, we'll see right now. So an internal GAN gets the input image as the only input it sees. It has no other images, no large data set of images as we're used to in the standard GANs. The generator aims to downscale this image and fool the discriminator as in every GAN. So after it downscales the image, we take crops from the input image as fake crops and crops from the input image, from the real input image, as real crops. The discriminator now tries to distinguish between the two and find out who is a fake crop, meaning from the generator, and who is a real crop from the low resolution input image. But it doesn't do it as a classical GAN given, out, given as output a single number of how likely it is of being real or fake. It outputs a map, a map of pixels where each pixel represents how likely is the patch it came from of being real or fake meaning the discriminator should distinguish for every patch in the image whether it's real or fake. And if the discriminator cannot distinguish between real crops from the input image and fake crops from the generator, it means the patch similarity is maximized, meaning the patches reoccur in the real image as much as they reoccur in the fake downscaled image. And if that is the case, it turns out that the generator is imitating exactly the correct downscaling it is modeling exactly the super resolution kernel. And that is what we're trying to do. And this is our GAN framework. So if we plug into the generator a standard neural network, what we'll get is rather than downscaling, we'll get the generator memorizing patches from the input image and just outputting them to the discriminator. And by that, it will fool the discriminator because it is outputting crops from the input image. But the point is we're trying to model a linear downscaling, which is obviously a standard neural ne network is much more expressive. We're trying to model this. We're trying to model a convolution with a single kernel and downsampling. And the question, the intuitive question is why not just use a linear model? 
take a single layer convolutional network and plug it into the generator. And by that, the generator should try to learn the set of weights such that it's imitating the correct super resolution kernel. Well, that's what we did. We plugged the single convolutional layer into the generator. And we took many different kernels and downscaled many different images. And then if these are the ground truth kernels, these is, this is what we got. Far from being uh, enough for us or accurate. So we thought about why did this happen? And it turns out that our discriminator is a standard neural network, meaning it's non, it's nonlinear, and mean, and, and and that affects the loss to be non-convex. And we know from deep learning that there is a conjecture or a heuristic that there is no bad local minima. If we reach a local minima, where it's good enough for our task. But in this task, it's a pretty, it's a different task. In this task, we're looking for a set of weights in the generator that will imitate the super resolution kernel. Or in other words, we're looking for a single global minimum, which is the set of weights that is exactly the super resolution kernel. And we know from deep learning that we cannot find a single global minimum. So what did we do? We changed the single layer convolutional convolution into a deep linear network. This sounds kind of weird, but a deep linear network is just stacked convolutions. It's one after the other after the next, with no nonlinearities and no, no ReLUs, no sigmoids, no anything between the layers. And the intuitive first question that comes to mind is what's the difference between the two sides of this equation? Because if we just stack up all these convolutional filters into one, we get exactly a kernel K. And that's exactly the set of weights on the right. And that's correct. There is no difference in the expressiveness. But it turns out that this set of weights that produces K can be factorized into infinitely many decompositions. Because they can take, say, the factor two and multiply it with the first filter, and half and multiply it by the second filter. And it will still get the same kernel K. And it can do it in the more general case using a matrix A multiplying the first filter, and the inverse of it multiplying the second filter, or any two filters in this deep linear network. And by that, we created infinitely many solutions to this single global answer. And we created infinitely many good minima in this non-convex optimization surface. So we did this thing. We plugged in this deep linear network into the generator, and these are the results we got. Note how they're much more accurate and much more resemble to the ground truth kernel. And this actually worked. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first practical use of deep linear networks. It's an active field of research that we've heard at least two talks in this uh, week. Very interesting, and he, in this place, we found a very practical use for it. So we take these estimated kernels you see on the bottom, and we plug them into the family of methods that assume that someone provided this kernel. And let's see some results. So if this is a random image with an unknown kernel, no one has any information about the kernel. This is just simple by cubic interpolation. And if we zoom in to the woman's eye and hand, we'll compare this to several methods. So state-of-the-art super resolution performs like this. And if we flicker between, between the two, once again, it's nothing bad in your eyesight. There is no difference between the images. It's just uh, more sophisticated by cubic interpolation using a network that was trained for a week and a half. And if we use our method, we plug this low resolution input image into our network, we get a prediction of what, of an, uh, we get an estimation of the ground truth kernel, of the super resolution kernel. We plug that into a, 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 uh, a method that we didn't even make, several methods, and we achieved this result. This is using zero shot super resolution, or known as ZSSR. And when we flicker between the two, note not only the improvement in quality in the large image, but also the details in her eyes and in her sweater, and even the texture around her eye and the skin. And we com when we compare our method to the second family of method that try to be agnostic to the kernel, that actually aimed to the blind super resolution task, and actually won the previous challenge that had to do with blind super resolution, these are the results. So at first, at f at first glance, it looks like very nice results, pretty, pretty clean and clear. But if you compare them to the ground truth, they're far from that. And then when I flicker with our results, I want you to notice both the artifact around her nose and around her hand. 
and also the details that are lost around her eye and many uh, hallucinations in her sweater on the bottom. And if we go even further to, the, to outside these algorithms comfort zone into really low images, really low resolution images, old Im imagery, we're obviously also there, we do not have the kernel. We take this image, uh, image of Kennedy and focus on the face. WDSR and PDN are the winners of the blind super resolution challenge. Note how they over smooth the face and lose a lot of details. And while Michaeli and Irani also estimate the kernel and plug it into the same method we plug it in, our estimation is much more accurate and is able to produce much better performance. And when we zoom into a different part here, note how the blind super resolution once again creates severe artifacts in the image that are not even explained. The third example is of these soldiers in a parade. It happens across all the images we've tested. And note how, again, the blind super resolution just creates severe artifacts, assuming they can perform super resolution on all the images using a single network. And it doesn't have to be that far fetched. It's, it's not only on these black and white old images, it's also on more realistic images, where if we focus on the girl's face, RCN is a state of the art super resolution, PDN was the winner of blind super resolution. Note how they, uh, once again, they cannot differ the artifacts from the details and, and then they actually enhance these artifacts. And here again you can see where Michael and Irani estimate a kernel compared to us. Using the same exact method, the accuracy of the kernel produces much better results. We also extensively created, uh, made comparison to all the method methods we found and we outperform all of them by half a dB to one dB in PSNR, which is a significant margin. You can see more details in the paper. And to conclude what we did, we introduced kernel again that estimates super resolution kernel given the input image. We do it in a fully unsupervised way using no other examples than the image itself. It trains only on the input image and produce it using an image specific internal GAN. Hopefully you've understood what's an internal GAN now. And to the best of our knowledge, it's the first practical use of deep linear networks. But the most important contribution is that we take a large step forward towards super resolution in the wild, namely super resolution to any given image without any prior knowledge or assumptions. Thank you very much.